Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Middleway for the service of the Holy Eucharist Rite 2. Our opening hymn this morning is number 72. Our service this morning begins with the lighting of the Advent wreath. This Sunday is the third candle, the pink one, 
the candle of joy in the tradition of the liturgical churches. And I invite you to share something that has given you joy in the past few weeks, or perhaps this Advent, or recently, something that has lifted your heart towards joy and love. My granddaughter Nina, who had her third birthday yesterday. Woohoo! <laughs> Happy birthday. Say her name again. Mina. Mina. Happy birthday, Mina. Katie's back in church. Praise God. I, wa I had a moment of joy walking into the church this morning and seeing all of the wreaths up and the preparations for, for Christmas. As you know, Advent, and this wreath indicates that, are the, it's a time when we prepare for Christmas. And people sometimes new to the Episcopal Church, come in and say, where are the Christmas carols? What's going on here? What's going on here is we're getting ready. And so I hope that this getting ready will be meaningful for you in the remaining days of Advent. And uh, somebody mentioned, we've been reading the, a chapter a day of the Gospel of St. Luke during Advent since some people have been sick and so on. We thought we'd do a program that basically is being conducted by email. So I'd love to hear the comments from anybody after the service about what they're learning or being surprised by, perhaps, in the Gospel of Luke. The service of Holy Eucharist, Rite 2, begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Our, our service continues with the Gloria on page 356.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We'll use the collect on the insert in your bulletin. We'll use the contemporary language together. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Our service continues with the scriptural readings. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the year and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities and the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now read Psalm 126 responsively by half verse, ending with the refrain. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Our second reading comes from 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. 
Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our service continues with hymn number 437, Tell Out My Soul. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, 
Who are you? Let us have an answer to the, for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I am very comfortable at Grace Church. It gives me joy every time I walk in these doors. I started attending here in 1995 and was a member of the congregation until 1998 when I moved to St. John's Harper's Ferry where Bob DuBose lived and he and I married in this church and Peggy was the organist. <laughs> so Bob lived next to St. John's in Harper's Ferry so I started going there. And then I was asked by the Reverends Ed Green, Joe Makoff, and Jane Kempster to consider becoming a candidate for the priesthood. My three years of study opened my eyes to how the church sociology sees the church in contemporary times. The, the consensus of those sociologists and historians the church today needs to change, or it will die. But until 2011, there was one constant across all the so-called mainline churches, and certainly the churches in what was then the Nelson Cluster, most of them shrank in numbers attending. And the children of people who had grown up in the large congregations of the 1950s and 60s did not, for the most part, join churches when they became adults. So we can look around this congregation. Where are the contemporary teenagers, James and John and Joe and Paige? Where are Jenna and Jody? Where are Natalie and Olivia? Where are Anna and Emma and where is John Philip? If there's anybody in this congregation at the moment that's under 40, please let, well, perhaps you folks, I don't know, I don't know you well. No. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so things, things have not changed since I, took my studies for the priesthood. And uh, on the third Sunday in 2011, and that's what, uh, 12 years ago, I preached some pretty much like this sermon at St. John's, Harper's Ferry, and at St. Bartholomew's just down the road in Lee Town. I wish I could tell you that something has changed since then. All of us who worship here in 2023 find this way of worship comfortable and joyful, along with the music that accompanies it. We may even remember the good old days when 
Most churches used the 1928 prayer book, and we might recall good old Father Parker or Father or whoever, certainly was a father in those days, um, proclaiming after the confession, hear what comfortable words our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says to all who truly turn to him. The trouble is that when Thomas Cranmer wrote those words in the 1500s, comfortable did not mean what it means today, all at ease and cozy. It meant strengthening. And on a really, just about wherever you find it in the Bible, that's what it means. So, I read a sermon by a Lutheran bishop named Mike Reinhardt, and this sermon that I'm going to preach today, and which he wrote, I believe, in 2010, is truer than ever. I've altered it somewhat, and some of the words are mine, but it's basically his ideas. Here's my hunch, and I'm putting all my eggs in this basket. The turnaround of the mainline churches will happen when we in those churches care as much about those outside the church as we do those inside. To embrace relevance, we will have to let go of survival. Relevance is not everything. Relevance is, to some degree, a contemporary catchphrase. But if you think of it as relating in a meaningful way to, it looks like we're not relating in a meaningful way to the younger people who may come to the church on Christmas and Easter and delight to see their aunts and uncles and mom and dad and all the dear familiar people, but then we don't see them anymore. So he says, to embrace relevance, we will have to let go of survival. <clears throat> a dear, dear lady at St. Bartholomew's, where I was the supply priest for three years, said to me one time, darling, after you bury me, I don't care what happens to the church. And she winked. She didn't really mean that. But I think some people have that theory, let me be buried from this church. Just keep it open long, long enough. Let it survive. So, Bishop Reinhardt said, that's it. That's all I've got. If I'm wrong, fire me now. And if you all are offended by this sermon, fire me now. He said, I'll die on this hill. What does this mean? My theory is that the mainline churches have ceased to be re relevant to the culture because insiders trump outsiders every time. Decisions are made for the benefit of those inside rather than those outside the church. In every single decision, even the little ones, insiders trump outsiders. I adore the music that Peggy plays. Even if I don't know some of it, like this morning's version of hymn number 437, I know the other tune to that. And so, people make jokes about the, the more contemporary churches, the, the giant churches, which by the way are losing people by droves too. And, and the words up on the wall instead of in the hymnal. I don't know if music makes that much difference, honestly. I think people care more about the kind of welcome they receive, the kind of warmth they perceive in the church than they do about music. But certainly, most of the music, even in the 1982 hymnal, most of the... the, the the large portion of that music was written at least 150 years ago. So we know what people are listening to contemporarily. We, we hear about praise teams and guitar teams and so on. And, but 
most of the hymnal that we love so much and that we enjoy singing so much doesn't speak to contemporary people. But contemporary people won't be offended by a guitar playing or a praise team in church. Time and again, church leaders receive heat from church insiders, upset about this or that, because the insiders are trying to maintain or recreate their childhood church experience or simply have a rigid idea of what church is supposed to be. Church leaders cave into these insiders because many of them control the purse, purse strings. More facts on the ground. Insiders are inherently change averse. People don't like change. I don't like change, especially those who have status in the church. Peter Steinke, one of the contemporary sociologists who was a sociologist of big or big corporations, but also of the Lutheran church. He taught us that every church is an emotional system. Some people are benefiting from the system as it currently is. Yes, some people benefit emotionally. They are <coughs> revered as church saints, or they are validators to whom everyone turns for the approval of decisions. They are having an emotional need met by receiving recognition. Or perhaps they are simply tirelessly defending the tradition, regardless of how new or unhelpful that tradition may be. My husband loves to tell the story that the first time he came to this church with me, Pep Grantham took him over to the window and he said, all our best people are out there. So the tradition the memories of wonderful Pap Grantham, of William O. McCautry, of the people that we remember and love, and some of them were true eccentrics and some of them were saints. And some of them were just the faces we knew and were familiar with. But now they aren't here anymore. And if their spirits are filling up the pews, I love that idea, but we don't see their bodies anymore. Peter Drucker once said, when the rate of change outside the organization exceeds the rate of change inside the organization, the organization is doomed. In other words, we who take such joy in this wonderful church and these wonderful people that we know so well are going to have to do something if we want this church to continue. And just a reminder, if some people are not very comfortable with this reminder either, the church, this building where the sunlight pours in from the wonderful windows, where we see our beloved friends, where we delight in our chats before church, where we delight in gathering over at Grantham Hall. This is not the church. You are the church. You are the church. And this building is wonderful, but you are the church. You are the body of Christ. Why is the slow bleed that we're experiencing now happening? Church structures, buildings, and other official places were set up to preserve what exists, not to change it. These stable structures work well when society is changing slowly and imperceptibly. If something is working, protect it at all costs. But what if it is not working? Grace Church has made wonderful adaptations to the harsh reality of COVID. The congregation got electronic, so to speak, and our 
services still go out to people who are not here, they're at home. They're part of the body of Christ too. So we've made that adaptation. But there are more adaptations to be made if we can really connect with the current society. Some parts of the current society I don't care about and I don't want to see us connect with them. But what I do think is important that we at least to some degree speak the language of what are people who are called Gen X or even younger than that, the millennials. And now there's apparently a Gen Y as, as well. And I try to keep make friends with people like that and get to know them. But I'll tell you, most of us are probably either baby boomers or older Gen X. And how many of us know the younger people that might make the, li the life of this church continue if it were to continue? So what do we do about change? We adapt, and to some degree we have adapted, as I said. The church has adapted, survived, and even thrived in times of tectonic change in the past. It can again. Stable structures are a high value in a stable culture, but when in a climate of rapid change, adaptability is the higher value. And leaders who don't get this are in for some tough sledding. Change is hard. Change, however, is non-negotiable. The only constant in life is change. There is no growth without change. As someone once said, the only one who likes change is a wet baby. Any <coughs> Any kind of change creates conflict. Leaders can only tolerate so much discontent, and even a little discontent sounds loud when you're in the hot seat. So when things heat up, leaders circle the wagons, which is precisely the wrong thing to do. Instead, leaders need to be bold. Lead boldly. Look at any successful enterprise, and you can be sure that someone, at some point, took a huge risk along the way. Nothing great is accomplished without risk. The, tr the trouble with Steve Jobs, as some people said, is that he likes to make his own rules, whether the topic is computers, stock options, or even pancreatic cancer. The same traits that make him a great CEO drive him to put his company and his investors at risk. That's from Fortune magazine. Now, <clears throat> change is not necessarily a good thing. Some, people, some people saw Sam Bankman Freed, I believe that's his name, uh, the Bitcoin guy, as a great innovator. He was going to be the Steve Jobs of his generation. Well, he's going to jail because what he, do, what he did was was phony. It was not real money. In any case, along with the need to pay attention to what's happening in our culture, we also have to employ our discernment, our perception, and our common sense. Most organizations won't change until they're desperate. Like the alcoholic that won't go to rehab until she hits rock bottom. So what will give us the courage to take these risks? This takes us back to the beginning. Churches will not adapt to new realities until they care as much about reaching those outside as, those, as appeasing those inside. Jesus spoke to, healed, and befriended outsiders. Can we say the same of ourselves? It seems like the world is hell-bent 
on destruction in countless ways. It is desperately in need of a church that offers a way of peace, truth, joy, compassion, and hope as opposed to the world's way of power, materialism, exploitation, and violence. It needs leaders willing to risk comfort, status, and economic security for the life of the world and the outreach potential of the church. It needs a church that looks like, less like the Pharisees' religion and more like Jesus' ministry. It needs a church that is willing to sacrifice everything for those outside, buildings, budgets, sacred cows, traditions, and structures. It needs a church that loves the world so much so that she'd be willing to die for it. So what if there were some new policy? What if every decision, every single decision made by staff, vestry, and every committee is made on behalf of those who are not yet here? Every sermon choice, every hymn, song, and musical choice, every building and grounds choice, every spending choice is made with outsiders in mind because they were the people Jesus loved. When we become a church for the world, the outsider, when the pain of staying the same and dying of irrelevance for those already here exceeds the pain of changing and sacrificing old ways for those not yet here, we will be the church for which God incarnate, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, came to this earth and gave his life. We don't need to be the so-called church of what's happening now. I'm not talking about being trendy. I'm talking about being known for something so enlivening, so life-giving, that people want to see the people that made it happen, want to know them, want to experience the kind of love that they have shared with the world. So we don't have to be trendy, but we do have to pay attention, and we do have to show love. In our lives as followers of Jesus, we need to become known for ministry by the whole congregation that reaches out to the outsiders and brings them in. That's what Jesus did. Let's find a way to serve the ones he loved and still loves. Amen. Amen. Our service continues with the Nicene Creed found on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified by Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again and was 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found on page 387 of the prayer book. In today's prayers, let's remember Mag and Lynn, Mary Ellen, Stanley, Haley, Leslie, Nancy, Sandy, Mark, Bianca, Linda, Mark, Terry, Nancy and her family, Carrie Beth, Lonnie, Barbara, Brady, Diana, Honey, Dennis, Carolyn, Robert and Margaret, Michael, Jason and his family, Tanya, Rennell, Judy, Kenny, Don, Richard, Peter, Michael, Harold, Andrea, Michael, Nelson, Dana, Charles, Kate, Charlotte, Pam, Sandy, Catherine, Ray, Priscilla, Selena, Robbie, Brenda, and Lynn, Nancy, Jay's friends and family, Jason, River, Katie, and Peggy's upcoming surgery, our service members at home and abroad and victims of natural disasters, Christians around the world, and in our West Virginia diocesan cycle of prayer, Episcopal Service Corps, and volunteers in mission. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That, that we all may, may be one. one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. people. We pray for all bishops, <coughs> priests, and deacons. That, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May, May we also come, come to share in your heavenly kingdom. kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for the people of Israel and the people of Palestine. We pray for a new understanding. We pray for people on both sides whose lives have been ravaged by violence. And we pray for a growth in understanding, tolerance, and compassion for one another and the opportunity to live together side by side with hope and with faith. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. Continuing on page 360 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. and By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And please, let's exchange waves and so on. It's okay if you kiss. <laughs> Peace be with you. Are there any announcements before we continue with the service? We have a baptism here next Saturday, and everybody's invited to attend the baptism of the That's Bobby's granddaughter. Grandson. Flynn. Oh, it's a boy. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And we have Christmas Eve here at 3 p.m. Correct. Yep. Right. So, um, brothers and sisters, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may, without shame or fear, rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy and peace, and at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. As you come forward for the Eucharist today, we will be taking the Eucharist in one kind because there are so many viruses, et cetera, circulating around Jefferson County right now. We will not be passing the cup. Continuing on page 365 in the Book of Common Prayer, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in this sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 539.
peace of God go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you from the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.